well, I'm getting up in years, and I have a friend that, or two friends that we fished together. We, we graduated high school together, and now we're fishing together again. But our biggest problem with our old age is we sit in a boat for a while, and we get all stiff and bound up. And uh, one night, my buddy Harlan, he fell in the river, and then I was getting out of the boat, and I fell in the river. So we just got one to go now. Mr. Pence's day will come. We're going to have to push him in the river, I think. Rivers meander through the lives of everyone. Rivers and streams connect all of us. Water knows no city boundaries, county boundaries, state boundaries, or property boundaries. We are the rivers, and the rivers are us. My mom wouldn't let me go down by the Cedar River when I was little, but she let me go to a stream called Prairie Creek. It was about the size of this stream. Starting when I was about eight years old, I got to go down there by myself. It was about a mile from my house, and I'd walk down there with my friends, and we'd walk around in the woods, and we'd build forts, wade in the creek, built rafts that always sunk. So you never wanted to be the first person to test the raft. But we had a great time. Sources of abundance and destruction, life and death, creativity and imagination. Rivers and the fresh flowing waters are at the heart of human existence. Brush Creek uh, to me has kind of been a blessing and a curse. Uh, on a day like today, uh, it's, it's a good place to come down to and kind of recharge your batteries. Uh, j just the beauty of it to me, even though I've been here over 30 years, the newness hasn't wore off. Um, when, it's, when it's wild, when it gets, you know, the flood stage, uh, she, she does do a lot of damage. Rivers and streams are so interwoven into our lives that at times we don't even see them. One thing I found when I first brought students down here was that uh, when I said we were going to the river, they said, well, what river? And I said, well, we're going down to the park just down the hill. And they said, oh, that's not a river. They called it a ditch. They called it a creek. Uh, they, they were very surprised, or at least some of them were very surprised when I said that, no, this was a river. We showed them on the map how this river actually flowed to Des Moines. Most of the major rivers in the world have been shaped by centuries of human activity. River management intensified in the 1900s as people began to think of rivers as agents of economic and social opportunity. River after river was transformed to meet the ever-increasing demand for water, for industry, agriculture, recreation, electricity, tourism, and flood protection. Time and again, we learn that people can't out-engineer the rivers. Flooding occurs naturally. Development is what makes it a problem. Rivers and streams left to their own devices want to meander. You know, we've, we've gone in from an engineering standpoint. We've deepened and straightened a lot of our streams in Iowa, and now we see that there are bank, bank stability problems. As we started to change some of the hydrology through our land use changes through the channel straightening, we took a, what was a stable stream, made it uh, unstable, um, increased some of the transport capacity of sediment down that stream, and so now many of them are in the process of uh, trying to uh, come back into an equilibrium with the, the new type of system that we have here. Human engineering wasn't limited to rivers. The demands of urban centers and agricultural production pushed society to fundamentally change the landscape leaving few natural settings undisturbed. At the heart of human management is the desire to conform and tame what was by nature wild and unknown. They call them meandering streams, and there's a reason for that. It don't want to go straight down the line. It wants to wander around a little bit. But we and our, our practices try to straighten it out as much as we can, and that's probably wrong. It, the river is totally different than it was when I was a kid. If it's just weather patterns, 
It, part of it is changing in farming, changes in farming practice. We don't leave much grass grow out there anymore. It's all corn, beans, uh, very little livestock. Grasses and haylands filter the water and slow it down. It doesn't get to the river quite as fast. We put a lot of tile in the ground. We've built a lot of Walmart parking lots and that water all has to go somewhere. None of that seeps into the ground. So just society, changes in society have changed the, the uh, process of water moving down the channels. I think greediness is probably our biggest problem, but you can, you can find that in all facets of life. Although rivers are only 0.2% of all the fresh water on Earth, they are vital carriers of water and nutrients. Rivers drain nearly 75% of the Earth's land surface. They provide habitat, nourishment, and transportation to countless organisms, not just humans. In the dictionary and in the textbook, they define natural resources as materials found in or on the Earth that are used by man and I said, or used by humans, and I, and I told the students, and I tell the students every year, that I think we need to expand that picture to having resources being used by other living things. Because focusing only on what is valuable to humans, I believe has led to some of the environmental problems we have today. Uh, too narrow of a focus, uh, first we start thinking in terms of what's used by humans and before long it's what's used by me. And then you narrow your focus so much that you start doing things to the resources that really impact other people's use of those same resources and other living things use of those same resources. And I believe personally and as a teacher that if we focused on the things that are on our earth to be used are to be used by all living things we would take better care of them and it would be better for all of us in the end it's all connected water that enters a stream in one location will be used by someone or something as drinking water downstream rivers are the arteries in a complex system that sustains life for a multitude of organisms bacteria algae Plants and animals all contribute to the biodiversity of our river systems. There's a lot of ways to explain biodiversity. One that makes sense to a lot of people is that there's a lot of species we use in various ways, food sources, medicine sources, uh, all kinds of things. And there's a lot of species that we haven't tested yet to see if they would be useful to us. If we drive them to extinction before we figure out whether they're useful, we're gonna have missed that opportunity. Another way to think about it is, biological species live together in a, in a community, and they basically all have some roles in that community. We as biological scientists might have some ideas about some of their roles, but we don't necessarily understand all their roles. It's kind of like saying, okay, here's this puzzle. I'm not sure what this piece does, so I'm just gonna throw it away. What do you have now? You got a puzzle that's not gonna, you, you can't complete. So in a sense, all the species in a particular uh, community, like in this stream that we're in right now, work together like parts of a puzzle. You start throwing away parts, who knows whether you're gonna be able to put the puzzle together in a way that you know, makes some sense. A day on the river is always worthwhile. Whether you live in a rural or urban setting, rivers and streams are some of our best natural areas. The river offers opportunities for excitement, quiet reflection, and learning. Wading, catching frogs and minnows, skipping stones, canoeing, kayaking, and fishing. Cross-country skiing in the wintertime. Many rivers have paths to walk so you can enjoy the beauty of different seasons. Do you want to come to the river and see dirty water? a bunch of trash? Many river enthusiasts have volunteered for river cleanup projects. In the fall of 2009, 100 Iowa State University students removed 2,900 pounds of trash 
along a three-mile stretch of the Skunk River in Story County, Iowa. Over the past 12 years, Jim Colbert and his students have removed almost 60 tons of trash from local streams. Much of it was recycled. When we take students out on the Skunk River Navy, the most common comment I hear is they just cannot believe that there's so much trash in the river. And they just, they ask me these questions like, well, where did this all come from? It's just really a shocker for them. <laughs> Every piece of trash has its own ugly little story. Um, some of it's left here on purpose. I mean, you can take a look up here at these uh, beverage cans up on the side. Somebody brought those down here. They were strong enough to bring in the full ones, but not strong enough to take out the empty ones. So some of it happens on purpose. Some of it is, you know, an accident. Something blows out of somebody's car, gets washed into a storm sewer, ends up down in the creek. Uh, so all of those things are, are possible. Um, and sometimes even big things are thrown in on purpose. Uh, people, we've, we've carried out a number of uh, old appliances, refrigerators, freezers, that sort of thing. And, you know, people just throw them in the river because they, then they can avoid uh, paying the landfill uh, disposal fee. Beyond beer cans, plastic bags, and appliances, river pollution is also present in many forms that we can't see. The transport of sediment, nitrates and phosphorus is of increasing concern because they disturb the biological balance of the watersheds. Mary Kester teaches middle school in Carroll, Iowa. She and her students have been monitoring the water in the Middle Raccoon River for 17 years. I started doing the river unit because of a summer class I took in Mankato, Minnesota and we did a uh, river study as part of that class, actually rivers and soils, and it intrigued me. Uh, in my sixth grade science class, natural resources was one of the topics we covered, and it seemed that in Iowa, uh, two of our most important natural resources would be the water and the soil. The land is as much a part of the picture as the water is. The water flows over the land. Um, it, it is so much of an interlocking picture. I think we're not doing the environment a favor if we try isolating pieces of it and just tending to those pieces alone. When I take students down here to study, um, we come down regularly and do chemical tests, and we use the chemical tests that are done through Iowa Water and tests for nitrates, nitrites, phosphorus, chloride, um, dissolved oxygen and pH. We also test for bacteria and we were surprised a couple of years ago bacteria levels were seemed quite high and um, and they're still higher than what you would like to see in a stream and then if we're going to look at the organisms where we'll actually you know maybe stir up the bottom and have a net and collect organisms then we're looking at the biological aspect which is very important because the organisms are in here 24 7 and if we do a chemical test and find out that there's high or low things one day, the organisms are exposed to that all the time. So by the presence or absence of different organisms, you can learn a lot about stream quality. In addition to sediment and agricultural and industrial waste, the EPA says that over the last three years, 37% of the nation's sewage systems have reported dumping untreated or partly treated human waste chemicals and hazardous materials into rivers and lakes. Thousands of pharmaceuticals from ibuprofen to Prozac also contaminate the aquatic habitat. What makes this so worrisome is that the usual safeguards protecting us from bacteria and toxin don't rid our water supply of these chemicals. The notion that drugs passing through our bodies might harm humans, fish, and other organisms for generations to come is just another example of the dangerous effects of human behavior, the echoes of which have yet to be fully heard. However, there is another echo emerging, faint but persistent and growing. The echo of people committed to a new ecological resilience 
and the goal of helping rivers and streams clean themselves. Well, we're standing here at Brush Creek and uh, we're trying to protect the stream and keep it nice and clean. Uh, we've done some things through the years, uh, starting with off to here is uh, a filter strip that was seeded to switchgrass in 97. And a continuation of that would be on the right side here. It's also a uh, filter strip with switchgrass. We've got that ground protected now, so we're not putting any more sediment into the stream. And we have a wetland up over here. You'll notice here in the, in the stream bed itself, uh, it's more of a cobble, which is more rock. You'll see a mixture of, of sand, where you have all kinds of nice, clean sand and gravel. That, actually, that's a fish nest. Uh, as you look over the other side here, you can see the sand show up. As long as we're not seeing silt mixed in with our rock along the edge here, I think we're looking at a pretty healthy stream at this time. All of these streams uh, kind of point to uh, the health of your whole environment. Uh, whether you're a farmer or whether you're an urban person, uh, anybody, this is all about the quality of, of the whole environment around us. Well, number one is go back to creating the wetlands that we've destroyed, bring them back into usefulness. I, I'm really a promoter of government programs. Now, a lot of people say, well, boy, that's tax money. That's fine. The people in the city can say, well, we're working for conservation too, because it's some of their money is doing the job. And I think that setting some land aside getting some permanent vegetation on it, I think that's a real plus for conservation. Yeah, if we look at uh, a lot of the upper Midwest part of the U.S., uh, pre-settlement, a lot of it had, a lot of that land was covered with uh, swamps and wetlands. Uh, throughout time, we drained a lot of that with artificial tile drainage. Wetlands are sometimes considered the kidneys uh, of our landscapes because they really do provide an essential function in uh, filtering and treating some of that water that may be running off of, of either our urban or our agricultural landscapes. And so um, as we look toward the future, seeing how we can integrate wetlands back into the landscape uh, to provide important ecosystem services, whether that be water quality, uh, wildlife habitat, uh, waterfowl habitat, um, or some other uh, biodiversity function, uh, quality of life or aesthetics. All those are important features that the uh, wetlands can provide. The kinds of land use that, that, we're, that we're doing, um, you know, put a lot of pressure on rivers because we're trying to use rivers to uh, quickly remove water from the landscape. We want things to dry out quickly so we can farm, etc. Doing things differently is gonna take money, it's gonna take time and energy, probably going to take some education. It's going to be hard to do. But if we don't do it, we're going to continue to have rivers that are full of silt, rivers that are full of um, nitrates and phosphates, rivers that are potentially full of pesticides of various kinds, herbicides and insecticides. There's just, it's just a difficult thing to do to economically exploit the landscape to the extent we're doing it and still protect the rivers. I guess I would argue so far we haven't been able to do it successfully, but I have hope for the future that we'll find a way to do it successfully. Perhaps hope for our rivers rests in the unanswered questions. Perhaps it rests in accepting that rivers cannot be controlled or made safe. Hope rests in listening, watching, and learning from rivers, and in letting them show us what needs to be done if they are to continue to sustain life. The older I get, I feel like I'm just, I'm just borrowing it, I'm just taking care of it for a, a short time. Obviously, I hope my kids uh, kind of continue with what we started here, and I, and I know they will, uh, but you know, we're, just, we're here for such a short time. I think we sometimes get caught up in the fact that uh, whatever our farming career is, that, that that's it. You know, we, we can just kind of deal with that and you know, somebody else will heal up the ground. I, I hope we start to look at it a little differently. Well, if we do nothing, 
I think um, what we see is the environment will get continually in worse shape, especially in respect to how humans want to use the environment. Uh, the water that we use for drinking would require more and more treatment as the soil is degraded through poor practices then more and more fertilizers or chemicals would need to be added so that it's able to grow the crops to the degree that we want and then those of course will impact the water. Um, in the ultimate end there will still be land and there will still be rivers and there will still be animals. The earth will continue as it's continued for the billions of years it's been here. A river and a campfire are very synonymous. There's something that just draws you to them and they're very therapeutic. I had a friend that owned a cabin here a few years back and he was injured in a bad accident. Basically the man healed up sitting down here on a bench watching the old river flow by. And I think that the river can do a lot for a lot of people that have problems. They just let it happen.